Last December, when doing his monthly slot on Nick Ferrari's LBC show, Keir Starmer was confronted with a racist conspiracy theory. The context was a conversation about Millwall fans booing when players took the knee in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. A woman introduced as Gemma from Cambridge called in to explain her husband had been one of the booing fans. She had this to say. Uh, Gemma, why did your husband, sorry, you didn't quite explain, if I may go there again, why did he choose not, to, uh, cho choose to boo, sorry? Because if anything, the racial inequality is now against the indigenous people of Britain because we are set to become a minority by 2066. And taking the knee, bringing that into, bringing the political sphere into the football arena, and we just have to look across to the Middle East. You know, Israel has a state law that they are the only people in that country to have self-determination. Well, why can't I, as a as a white British female, have that same right? Final point to you on this, Sakir. But Gemma, we, we all have those rights. This is about recognising some injustice has gone on for a very, very long time. And I think people were genuinely moved this year um, and want to make sure that that injustice is, is dealt with. And, you know, people will look at it different ways, but I think the vast majority of people do want um, a more equal society. Gemma, thank you. To other calls, Dominique and Islington. Now, in that very short clip, you heard both a far-right conspiracy theory and a far-right policy proposal. So the far-right conspiracy theory was the great replacement. So what it says is that indigenous people, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to say that without quote marks, indigenous people, which is her terms, by which she means white people, are being oppressed because they are being... Um, the demographics mean they're going to get replaced by ethnic minorities or non-Indigenous people, in in her words, um, by, I think they say, 2066. It sort of grows into this conspiracy theory where you have shadowy elites, often coded as Jews or often explicitly said to be Jews, um, who are intentionally trying to replace white Britain. So she went on LBC to say that it's white people who are subject to racism because of essentially the Great Replacement theory. The far-right proposal, um, so this is the solution she was suggesting, um, is that Britain should adopt something like Israel's nation-state law. Um, so that law states that only Jews in Israel have full democratic rights to self-determination. So I presume um, that person who was introduced as Gemma from Cambridge presumably wants white people to also only have full democratic rights in this country. Both appalling far-right conspiracy theories and policy proposals. We've talked about them on the show. And last time we talked about this clip, because that happened in December, um, we focused on Keir Starmer's weak response. So in response to that claim about the nation state law, he said, we, we all have those rights. and We don't all have the rights to sort of self-determine on the basis of our ethnicity. No, no, we don't, because we live in a multicultural society as we should. Also, when we talked about that show and what we also focused on was the identity of that person who called in because Gemma from Cambridge wasn't actually Gemma from Cambridge. Gemma from Cambridge was actually Jodie Swingler, a yoga teacher in Ibiza who is a member of the relatively new fascist party patriotic alternative. Now, on far-right blogs, after that conversation, there were people sort of celebrating, ah, oh, yeah, we've got our far-right talking points onto the mainstream media and not just that. We've put them to the leader of the opposition. It was already a pretty nasty story, but it gets worse because we had assumed that what had happened there was this person from a far right party had sort of basically trolled LBC. We thought that she, we assumed that she'd called up and said, I want to ask Keir Starmer a question about um, Black Lives Matter. And then unbeknownst to the producers, that's when she introduced the great replacement theory and this idea about the nation state law. But... It turns out that, in fact, Jodie Swingler, although they didn't know she was Jodie Swingler, she was invited by producers onto the show. So this is from this week's Private Eye. Now, after her turn on LBC, Swingler took to the airwaves on an episode of The Actual State of Britain, a racist anti-Semitic podcast run by PA supporters. In the podcast, heard by Red Flair and Private Eye, she reveals that LBC actually encouraged her to call in. She says that a week previously, she had made a call to presenter Majid Nawaz's show on LBC, claiming that her Millwall supporting husband had booed taking the knee. So she'd sort of done this already to Majid Nawaz, phoning up, pretending to be Gemma from Cambridge and saying, my husband was one of those people booing. Then, so after doing that, um, they phoned me up. So this is her speaking now on the po podcast. They phoned me Sunday night and said, Keir Starmer's on. Would you like to speak to him? I was like, yes, I would. 
but they said, with this, you know, ask a question about the Millwall taking the knee. Does he agree with freedom of speech? And they knew because of my previous call, they must have known I would have brought Israel into the conversation and seeing how the left has blown up. I honestly think they got me in as a bit of a trap for him. Now, that is appalling. And as I say, I doubt the LBC producers knew that she was actually um, this yoga teacher who was in a fascist party. But what they did know is that she'd spoken to a previous host on their radio show. And as she said, talked about the nation state law then. So all of the red flags, you know, they had all of the red flags that this was not just a normal person discussing freedom of speech and issues of whatever. This was someone who was an organized fascist who believed in fascist conspiracy theories. Uh, before the sort of big headline phone-in shows with big politicians like Keir Starmer or Matt Hancock, they don't just let any old person call in. Um, what they do is they seek out the best questions. So they, they'll be listening in on previous shows throughout the week and they'll say, oh, that caller, I'm going to get them back for this politician. And what LBC did was they heard that caller, this far-right caller, do all of these far-right talking points. And then they said, oh, let's get them on with the leader of the opposition. If you want to subscribe to a media platform that doesn't intentionally invite far right people on to amplify their ideas to the nation, um, then subscribe to Navarro Media. We go live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 7 p.m. Dahlia, what do you make of this? The LBC, it wasn't them getting caught out. It was them actively seeking, it seems, to platform these far right talking points. We really uh, underestimate how right wing the British media is. And I think that this is especially the case for uh, newspaper, but also radio media. And this is something, a harsh lesson I've had to learn from doing more media, uh, from, you know, going on radio shows that I haven't otherwise listened to before of doing newspaper reviews and things like that, and being kind of like regularly involved in that. And, you know, I, I, these, you know, these outlets like, like, LBC, like talk radio, th these are deeply right wing radicalizing outlets, but they are sort of allowed to be passed off as kind of just neutral actors in our kind of media sphere. And, you know, I remember um, on LBC not not that long ago, when we were, uh, we were, I was invited to talk about uh, a, I think it was a report that was being done by the University of Cambridge on looking back at, you know, how uh, the relate the historic relationship between the University of Cambridge and slavery, and um, you know they sought out a, a random guy with a history degree. I've edited a book and written several articles and essays, um, including academic essays on this topic, and they sought out you know some random dude who had done history at Cambridge, who came on and started talking about how Africa has never had a civilization, so it's somehow you know okay that slavery happened. I don't even know what that was, but that's an example um, of this kind of you know from production you know that background production you know who who decide who go on etc to those people who are on the front of the stage like your kind of nick ferraris etc but the uk media is is you know particularly rabid um when it comes to issues of racism and immigration uh you know the un high commissioner of human rights has had to sort of regularly call out the uk media as being specifically awful um, when it comes to this this topic um in in 2015 um, the the UN called you know called out the quote decades of sustained and unrestrained uh, anti foreigner abuse misinformation and distortion. It wasn't that long ago that Katie Hopkins had totally free reign in you know a major newspaper and an LBC a major major radio station to literally refer to migrants as like cockroaches because they are built to survive a nuclear bomb. Um, you know, that's almost identical to the language that was used in Nazi propaganda. And that's what, exactly what the UN High Commissioner said. So in all honesty, when I, when I see these kinds of things, it, it honestly makes me laugh at the kind of big crocodile tears that we regularly see um, in the pages of newspapers and, and in, you know, radio shows about, you know, how PC culture has gone mad and how, you know, their free speech is, is undermined because of how hard it is to be publicly racist. And also there's an issue of endemic transphobia as well, which is kind of similar. When the exact opposite is true, this, the status quo of the UK media is to systematically allow for the platforming of this kind of racial 
terror of conspiracy theories that that led to the murder of one of our MPs. Um, and it's just that for, this, for the first time ever, some of them are experiencing minor amounts of blowback for this um, on social media for their comments. And that's hurting their feelings because they're not used to hearing the other side of this kind of systematic um, inclusion of sort of very, very right wing concepts and very right wing um, ideas and platforming and encouraging them. And we see a much higher representation of that than we do of, you know, the anti-racist position. It's shocking, but as someone who has, and I'm sure you feel the same, Michael, as well, as someone who has been more involved in the kind of, you know, talking to producers and having more awareness and being in green rooms and having a bit more awareness about how this whole thing works, it is of absolutely no surprise to me that this is being systematically pushed from kind of the people who have the power to produce the content that is then passed off as sort of falling from the sky out of context. Mm -hmm.